Hey guys, just sat in my backyard today, feeling pretty chilled out, so if you watch the replay, give me a chilled out hello, let me know you're here, let me get out of the sun actually, probably be soaked in sweat by the end, so it's finally getting nice and warm out here in LA, which is good because it was rainy, nothing worse than being quarantined in the rain, I'm sure lots of the world is in that situation, so sorry for you if you're one of them. Um, What do I want to talk about today? I mean, I have a lot of stuff in my mind, but talking is what I've been doing kind of nonstop for the past, uh, well, I talk every day, but I've been in front of my computer coaching way more than I normally do. I had an in-person event called Creating Live that was going to occur this weekend in my home, and we created a virtual version of it. Um, did some other things, too, for those clients that had committed to being here. But uh, anyway, we spent a lot of time in front of the computer this weekend, um, and I've got some screen burnout. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing that, so if you're coming in, let me know that you're here, because on my iPhone, I don't think it tells me. But uh, hello, hello, whoever's here. I see some numbers, but no names. Yeah, my brain feels like it's got a higher density to it, like it's like there's more gravity on my head. There's a, there's a dense, there's like a thick energy and I think that's from being in front of the screen so much so today this is really my only screen time with you right here and I'm using my phone instead of my laptop because I need to relax just chill out do less slow down so I'm going to go slow today but I invite you to just be slow with me if you feel a sense of urgency and you're like not getting the information or the knowledge or the insights that you're feeling like you need right now um, I just invite you to use that awareness of that sense of urgency that's having you maybe switch off to something else, go find something else and just slow down. And maybe that means staying with me and being slow or maybe it means just switching this off and being slow, I don't care. But uh, one of the things I'm aware of right now is the way that I can have a, the most of an impact is to do nothing, which is kind of paradoxical. But being in captivity, which I'm calling it, living in captivity with my wife and my son. Um, there's this sense that we need to do something about that. We need to fill this space and this time, which is crazy. It's like trying to bring the old into the new. And so I'm making it a point to do less, especially in the afternoons once I finish coaching. So once I finish this conversation sharing with you guys, I'm just gonna do some reading, probably just sit around and do absolutely nothing. Maybe I'll switch the live back on later. Um, just be here. My son came out of the room, um, out of his room the other day. Let me tell you this. This is like a beautiful moment. My son wakes up in the morning around 6.45, kind of like clockwork. And I hear him. I'm out in the kitchen writing in my laptop or writing in my journal. And I hear pitter-patter, pitter-patter, pitter-patter. And he comes running down the hall. And he's rubbing his eyes when he busts into the living room. And he's like, hi, Daddy. And he can't even see. He's like, it's too bright. And so I say, Alexa, dim the lights. And then the lights dim. And then he's like, that's better. And I pick him up and I put him on my lap. And, and, I'm, and he's kind of like not really awake yet. And it's such a beautiful, like, I would say 30 to 60 seconds, maybe even two minutes, because he's there and he's letting me hold him. And he's not like, bah, 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 which I'm not, I love that too. But it's like, it's nice to just be with him when it's not like, this nonstop explosion of energy. So I could just get to hold him and be there with him. He's not going crazy or asking for a cookie or pulling at me or poking at me or just whatever. And so and I'm looking at him and I look into his eyes and I just have this thought like, holy crap, this kid's four and he can't leave the house because he's living in a pandemic. He's quarantined. He's in self-isolation. Um, and this is just his life. And he's starting to understand it. I'm like, what, what the fuck is the world going to be like when he grows up? holy shit, I've just created this child and I'm bringing him into a world and he can't leave the house and it's a pandemic. Like, what's this world going to be like with global warming and all the political stuff? And what's, and I just had this thought like, oh, like this, a moment of like worry, fear, concern for his future. But then I was aware enough to know that that was starting to happen. And I met it with, well, how can I create, where can we have certainty? if there's so much that's uncertain. Hey Dave, wow, good to see you, man. So my son's going into a world and you can't be certain what it's gonna be like. And I just looked him in the eyes, my four-year-old son, and I said, Asher, he looked at me, 
you know, half asleep. I said, I love you so much, and I promise that I'm going to do everything I can to help you to know how to be happy and to be peaceful and to have joy and to experience love no matter what's happening because I don't know what kind of world you're going to be living in and I don't know what's going to happen so I'm going to do my best to give you the, the capacity and the ability to meet whatever happens um, with the most ease and the most comfort and um, the most openness and he's looking at me like Dad, I just woke up. I don't know what the heck you're saying. I don't think I would. You know, it's like he doesn't know what I'm talking about. But it was a really beautiful moment, and it, and it was in a, you know, it was a moment where I realized that the only thing that I can do with my kid is help him to develop the capacity to meet this crazy, fucked up world that's just going to get more crazy and more fucked up. I can't save him from that. I can't save us from that right now. I can just help him just to meet that. My friend James says, you know, when the apocalypse comes and there's a shitstorm. All you can do is walk through it. And so it's like just walk through the shit storm that is life. Walk through, dance, dance until the world blows up, my friend Harry says. And so if I can teach him to walk in a shit storm and to dance even when shit's hitting the fan, then uh, that's all I really can do, I guess. And so I've, I find a lot of comfort in that and, and a lot more even purpose in my work. That's basically what I do professionally. It's what I do personally for myself. That's why I'm interested in philosophy and applying it, applied philosophy. Um, thank you, John Durkin, for that phrase. Um, and, uh, yeah, how can I think about and be with life in a way that makes it every moment enjoyable and loving and easy? So um, if that's useful for you in some way, then I'm happy that that's the case. Uh, what else do I want to share? So my wife and I are finding time to be together every evening by giving our son TV time in the evening, which is great. He gets to watch TV. He's psyched. We get some time alone where he doesn't interrupt us, which is really important right now it's amazing being in the same house all day and not connecting I don't know how it's possible but it's it is I said I I feel like we've got less connection now because we're together the whole day my friend who I was just talking to is like a single person this is this isolation thing hits them in a certain way because they literally they can't see anybody and they're alone but when you are with family all day you don't have any alone time which similarly creates a sense of loneliness because that intensity of being with them, but you can't really be with them because as everybody's around, it's like, so it's a similar sense of loneliness, but some, in one case because you're alone, in the other case is because you're never alone, which is weird. Loneliness comes through not having alone time at all and, and being totally alone. And so, uh, so because we're creating that marriage hour every night without my son there, we're able to not have loneliness because we're able to connect more intimately and my son's got time alone with me in the mornings just uh, every morning we do phonics and so we've got that connection so we're meeting it you know doing the best we've got all the food we need but I don't have any thing that can sanitize and kill the virus in the house if we do have any in the house I mean I'm going out every day to go shopping and not socializing but if I if there is a virus and I bring it in I realize we don't have anything to clean I mean, we can clean our hands, but all the stuff that we have that, like, can clean the house, like spray, we are, like, total hippies, and we have all this natural stuff. And I looked up the, f the stuff that we have, and it's, like, mm, not approved by the EPA to actually kill viruses. It's, like, oh, that's good. So that's one of the costs of being a hippie is, like, when there's actually a threat that you're concerned about, you don't have anything to kill it with. So can't buy Lysol anywhere. I've been looking online, so I sent the word out to my dad and mom and sis. If you find some stuff, let me know. So buy it for me and send it over. Um, I know washing your hands is important, but uh, it'd be nice to be able to know that I clean the doorknobs and it actually works. But it is what it is, you know, being safe as we can. I don't think, here's some things that I think, well, I'm not, uh, you know, I got the virus on my mind and in, in a way that I'm not afraid really, but it's uh, it's so interesting to me. I feel like, um, hey, Darren and Uve, good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. I'm gonna hit this wave button. What does that do? Wave, 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 wave. Hi guys. I'm so glad you're here. I just love knowing that you're here. Thank you. Um, my wife and I have a different perspective on the way, the way or the value, way we engage or the value of engaging. Like I'm, I'm really interested. I'm watching the news every day. I read the news a little bit in the morning and in the afternoons. I'm watching the press briefings from the White House, and I'm just. I feel like history is unfolding. This is an important time, and I want. And I'm curious about how it's all being handled and. And I'm seeing a lot of beauty in it. I mean, I was moved 
my heart was moved by Trump for probably the first time ever, just the way he's been showing up in the last few days. If you can see through the self-aggrandizement and, and um, I think what you can see is um, a person who has a part of him who's pulling him away from party and towards people. And I found that really beautiful. Uh, I found his story about um, the hospital that he grew up near, you know, really moving him to seeing the number of body bags being put into massive trucks and the story about his friend who's, you know, looks sounds like dying of the coronavirus. And I hear, I hear, maybe I'm wrong, but I hear a humanity in him that's uh, calling him in the direction of uh, the policies changes that he's making um, they're not in the interest of the economy and that could threaten his presidency and I think he's doing a, it's a typical Trump job of making a great case for how um, this is something that's important and patting himself on the back on it for it in a way where I think he'll probably pull enough of his supporters over to believe in him despite the economic damage that this approach that he's taking is going to make but um, of course, I'm for it. I think it's a beautiful uh, choice to put life and safety above the economy. But I know not everybody thinks that. Uh, a couple million people lost as a cost to keep the economy trucking along. I think a lot of people actually think that. Um, so I'm just glad that he, even though it looked like he was going down that path in the beginning, I'm glad that he uh, has chosen not to and that he's leaning more into life and safety first. And let him pat himself on the back for saving him, all the people in America and saving the world. He's going to do it for something. Whatever he talks about, he's going to he's going to do that, and that's just his his mo. Um, but I'm glad that it's going in that direction. I'm glad that there's money being sent out. I hope people actually receive it. Um, it's a good chunk of cash uh, for people that need it. And uh, I saw my accountant sent me this small business loan. So far, we've been not too impacted here in my business. Um, couple people that are you know having a hard time making payments so we're dealing with that managing that but um, I'm trying to keep money moving through the economic machine that is you know just the world just so you know keep bringing money in and keep putting money out I went to a local bakery today the French bakery that we usually go to on Sundays but I couldn't make it so I went twice today actually I went this morning to pick up croissants for my wife and I was the only one there and I said thanks for being open he said thanks for coming I let him know about that small business loan, and then I went back. Uh, I went for a walk today, and I went back and bought some more bread, um, just just because. Like we don't need it, but we'll eat it. But like, if I can keep money moving through the system locally and, and do my part to keep water money flowing, then that's what keeps the economy going, you know. So, um, and I think that's an important thing. I did a webinar last week for coaches about you know keeping your business going during the coronavirus, and I said slowing down and stopping is. Is, is actually kind of selfish right now because um, the more people that stop, the more the whole system comes to a halt. And so it's actually an active service to stay engaged in your business if you can legally, if it's safe to do so, and you're not spreading the virus. And with a virtual coaching business, it very much is. And so I think we owe it to the people who can't keep moving right now to keep moving, keep growing, keep asking for sales, keep bringing the money in and keep spending the money and investing it and putting it out. Um, so everything comes to a halt, then we're fucked. I mean, so it's each of our responsibility not just to wash our hands, but to keep the bigger system moving, just like they are at the hospitals, but economically as well. Thanks, Rob. Love it. Hey, Lawrence, good to see you guys. Lawrence, you you must have a hard time right now. Lawrence owns a beautiful retreat center. She's here in in Costa Rica that we did the creating, um, um, creating intensive at, the in-person retreat I did recently. So it must be tough in the hospitality business. My friend Noam, who's not here right now, is a friend of Lawrence, and he's got a restaurant. Nobody's coming to his restaurant anymore. He told me that some people wanted their money back because they prepay like 300 bucks to eat dinner at his restaurant. It's a fine dining restaurant in the jungle, and they prepay. Some people canceled and wanted their money back. Some canceled and said, keep it because we understand this must be tough for you. So it's a beautiful thing that people are making, are taking action right now in a way where they know that their money is a kind of medicine, actually, and we can help through when we can where and when we can afford to do so to keep money moving through the system I think that's an important way to take care of people right now is to not just get all scared and hold on if we can afford to if we can you know if we've got enough and then some then doesn't mean you have to donate necessarily if you see a way to do that do that too but at least keep buying things keep paying for things that's how we all that is our means of cooperation find uh, you know 
the flow of money through the system is how we cooperate. It's how we, uh, it's how we're helping each other. It's in uh, money just carries the energy of, of our service, you know. So keep the blood flowing. Um, yeah. And do nothing. This is like, I'm just slowing down right now to you because one of the reasons my head has felt so dense is my energy has been drained. I've been sleeping more than I thought I would. I think it's because of the thinking, like we need to do something about this. But we don't. Actually, we don't have to do anything. That's really important to remember. And also, um, the urgency inflames the body and it makes it more likely you'll contract the actual virus and it means that you're exacerbating the mimetic version of the virus. This is a distinction that I've been reflecting on. So there's the genetic virus itself that obviously people are getting. Um, and then there's the mimetic virus, which is the idea of the virus that pretty much everybody has to some degree already. It's infected the whole world. And it's amazing what this mimetic virus can do. It can scare the shit out of you. It can put you in scarcity and you can start to try to hold on, um, go buy shitloads of toilet paper, you know, not help other people. Um, thank you so much, Rob. I love you too, brother. Um, but the mimetic virus can also be an irritant that has you wake up to your own health and it has you actually think, oh gosh, I don't want to, people to be sick and I'm going to be altruistic and take care of people. And I just wrote something about this uh, this morning and shared it on Facebook and I think this virus is actually, I'm seeing that the virus is acting as a wake-up call to people. Like, you know like when you get sick and you're like sick and you're like, oh man, I so took for granted what it was like to feel really good and healthy. And then you get more specific. You're like, I took for granted I could go for a walk or go for a run or lift weights or that I could cook dinner or that I could go and ha be with people. And there's so many faculties that I had that I don't have access to right now because I feel so sick. And like, man, I'm, I'm really going to appreciate that when I'm better. I'm going to make a resolution here to do something differently. And oftentimes we come out of being sick with a new resolve and we actually show up in our life in a different way. And so you could say that a sickness um, is helping us to kind of realign and become more coherent in our life. Um, and, and I think that this, I see this virus doing that on a global scale. You've got all of humanity meeting the at least the fear virus, the mimetic version of the virus, and responding to it, and cooperating with each other, and staying and isolating in their homes. And I think this the collective consciousness of humanity is is right now thinking, shit, how could we, you know, I mentioned Trump earlier, like having a conversation with the Chinese president. We talked for an hour. We didn't even talk about trade. You know, he's actually a really good guy. And it's like, wow, th maybe cooperation is a thing. Maybe we could actually do more of that in other ways, too. Maybe this can have us start to appreciate the parts of our body that are the different countries and the different people and the different way they think about things. And so, um, you know, you could look at that and you could say, no, that's not what's happening. Um, you're being an idealist and I see this happening and you can see whatever you want to see. You can, I can sit there and see the other side and see how people are trying to like sell N95 masks for $500 and profit off it and how people are using it as opportunities, governments to pass laws, the, to um, to have more power over people, and uh, you, know, you can go on and on. You can do the same thing. But the second and more important point for me is that what we choose to see creates, it creates our experience of what's happening right now, which then creates thinking in my mind and being of that. And then I am culture. Society is me. I am society. And so what I choose to see and how I choose to see it, not to not not necessarily see things that aren't there, but the aspects and the, and the way I interpret it creates my experience of it, and actually it creates a society that's way. So I'm going to see optimistically, not to delude myself, because but because I know that the way that I choose to see is an act of creation. And so one of the things that I can do is just decide how I'm going to see this. How am I going to see it? What am I going to make it mean? Am I going to start going all conspiracy theory and propagating fear? No, but it's not because I don't think a lot of them are probably accurate and true. It's because of what it does to me and the world I create through seeing that way. And so I'm choosing to see the love and, and the collaboration that's coming from this and the possibility from it. Just like when you're sick, you could get pissed off or you could be like, you know what, I'm going to focus on my immunity and I'm going to make a better health and a better body. And I'm going to make more of my life because of it. And so that's what I see happening. That's what I'm choosing to see happening. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. So I'm loving the virus. I'm not loving it as in I want more of it, like give us more virus. I'm loving it in the way that I'm engaging with it in a way that's open and creating possibility from it. 
And I'm also loving the pain and the hurt. We have a family friend who's dying of COVID right now. Uh, hopefully he doesn't die, but the, the text message we got from uh, his uh, ex-wife was not good. Tough, tough shape on a ventilator, really high fever. I'm just slowing down thinking about it because he's, you know, it was based on my mom and dad met another couple on their honeymoon um, and they ended up having kids the same time as my mom and dad and so their kids and uh, my sister and I we spent our summers with them and a big part of my childhood is my memories of being with them and just the thought that right now he's you know on a ventilator dying and, and or in really tough shape is, and his kids can't even go see him because you know they're not allowed in the hospital because of the virus and how contagious it is it's it's sad it's painful and uh, I'm loving that. And loving it doesn't mean like, hey, to me, loving something is like, okay, I'm feeling with it. I'm, I'm being with it. It's, it's what's, what's happening. I'm going to meet it with an open heart and, and be real with it and just actually like embrace it. Not like I want more of it, but like, okay, let me just hold this as it's happening. And I feel like being with what's actually happening is a really responsible act that to ignore it and to avoid it is not being at peace with it it's just it's it's i think we need to be connected to the actual world that's happening but i don't think that means we need to be afraid or we need to resist it so going with it and trying to make the most of it and create with it and let it teach me something and see how it's positively impacting the world because that seeing is creating who i am and that's going to ripple out for me so i'm hoping it's rippling into you choose to love the virus because of what it creates seeing is creating i'm going to sign off michael good to see you my friend paul dave Lawrence, I love all you guys. Much love. Bye for now.